And what was it like, the difference between directing on the Guthrie in Minneapolis, which is an asymmetrical version, yeah. and a symmetry version, which is this? What, yeah. what are the different feels of those spaces? I don't know. I was just a much more confident man then, of course. And I, when, I, when I left here, I left with a sense of terrific achievement, with a terrific company. The company grew during my last years here in the, in the 60s to a tree. And they were really you know, acclaimed in, in Chichester, acclaimed in England. Uh, and um, they had a rare thing, a really rich, middle-aged part to their company. It was always the most, which m many Shakespearean companies lack. And that would have been the Eric Christmas, Eric House, Tony Van Bridge. That's right. Yeah, that all, that, all that part. Eric Christmas was Grumio in that uh, production of the... At the Fire. The, yeah. And he was, you know, very good comic. Fine comic. I want to go back to your mentors. The, 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 you were talking about Guthrie, but Basil Dean was another of your... Basil Dean? Basil Dean? No, I, I never knew Basil Dean, but I did have occasion to be involved with him because it was a strange thing. I'd been a prisoner of war, and uh, when I came back from being a prisoner of war, books were being published by other prisoners of war about what life was like. None of them were any good. Uh, and, uh, or were it, or not, I don't mean any good, they weren't in any way resembling what I knew, until I read a book called Yes, Farewell. It was a quotation from Dostoevsky, meaning, yes, I really mean it, I'm going, good, I'm going goodbye. And the, the play was about a prison camp and about escapes and about developing a tunnel and doing a play on top of the tunnel, on, top of the, on the stage over where the tunnel would break and inviting the guard company in while they watched the play, there was the tunnel would break, that sort of thing. And um, I wrote to the author and said, you know, I found this a very affecting book, and it was like what I knew. Had he thought of making it into a play? And he wrote back, he was Michael Byrne, uh, at Times, Times correspondent in Vienna, and he'd been in the camp with me, and uh, he wrote back and said, I have, here's a, here's a, a play version of it. And I'd just be, got my first job in the Midlands, and it was, and I, put, I was going to put it on, and, and um, opened in Kidderminster, of all places. Uh, and it was about people escaping, whether they were escaping for, out of patriotic causes or just because they couldn't bear to be with themselves anymore, they couldn't bear the self-examination that goes on in a camp like that. Or, and um, there was one guy who was sort of anti-hero of the play, who was studying all the time, studying all kinds of things, very left-wing things, Marx, et cetera, et cetera. And at the end of the play, it's a question of whether the Russians are going to get to the camp first or the Americans, Russians from the East, Americans from the West. And in the end, it turns out to be the Americans. And the night before they arrive, this guy escapes to the East. Yes, well, well I mean it. I am going. I want to find out what it means, communism. Maybe there was a star in the East before. And it was a very left-wing play, but not, I mean, it was a romantic communism. And the, when we did it at Kidderminster, Basil Dean came to see it, wanted to take it to London. That's why he's important in my life for nothing else. Uh, though he was a very good detailed director, d crazy about detail. Um, the, the, the Iron Curtain fell. Boom. You couldn't think of doing that play absolutely out. It's never been done since. Um, but you mentioned that, Basil Dean. That's why I've no. digressed in such a sort of Your bizarre story. Your time in the prison camp. You were four years in the prison Five. camp? Five. Which camp? All over, because I escaped when I was first prison and, uh, a prisoner, and uh, therefore I was blacklisted. I was tr a troublesome person, and therefore any move from the camp, I was always on the list. Even after I met up with my brother, who had also become a prisoner later in the war, and we just came together and we wanted to share letters and everything. Oh, no, they wouldn't do anything for me. I was really dis to be distrusted. I spent two years uh, committed to escaping, uh, dyeing clothes, forging documents, um, and digging tunnels. And after two years, it seemed a waste of time uh, because I would never be allowed to go. I was, my training was of no use. Well, I was trained for the First World War. And I went back to an old hobby which was putting on plays. What do you mean you were trained for the First World War? I was trained in the beginning of World War II to take part in a trench warfare, as in World War, War, World War I. I was trained for that, yeah. because of the, you know, it was just 
blindness on the part of the military. And no one knew about these you know, quick sort of panzer races of code and that. Um, mechanized, mechanized storming. In. And where were you taken prisoner? In front of the Maginot Line, uh, opposite Merzig, south of Sedan, which is where they broke th through, in, in that part, where the Germans broke through. I then started putting on plays, and the plays we chose weren't uh, not sort of things that you, they weren't sort of boulevard comedies from the West End of London or anything like that, but mainly plays that would make a difference to life in a prison camp. Such uh, as? Largely from uh, socially significant plays of the American theatre, like Thunder Rock, of, of Robert Ardrey, Golden Boy, Clifford Odets, plays that were about values that uh, were important for us to... A Robert Ardrey play is about people who left the middle of Europe and uh, to escape all kinds of conditions that were uh, against their, li their lives. It was a play about people who thought there was no future for them, and they go to the, uh, to the uh, middle of Lake Michigan, they, they get sunk in a something, and they, they come up as ghosts to, uh, today, uh, and they find out that all the things they've escaped from have been rectified, that there was hope, that it was, you know, it, uh, I've not explained it very well. But the fact is, it was for people who thought there was no hope. And there were many times when we thought, why don't they just pack it in? There's, n there's no chance of them winning this war. But for us, it was very, very good to, to have something to show. Look, look, it, it, it isn't always bleak. Things can turn absolutely the other way up. Uh, and when one or two people explained to me or us that what we were doing had made them change their minds, it was a lot of suicide. And when you know, quite a few of this, uh, these incidents came up of people talking like that to us, I began to feel there was nothing else I wanted to do with my life, but make theatre that would make a better world. Uh, I was a legal student before the war, and I reluctantly, I, I wanted to go into the theatre then, but my family thought it was too degrading a profession. You see, As the same actor. old, uh, yeah, the same uh, old thing, act, or even the same sort of thing. Uh, and um, well, that had a huge effect on me. I knew that was, I was dedicated. And I was also dedicated to a sort of romantic idea of socialism when I came back. Um, and I, when I got home, I got a letter from a famous actress in England. Uh, it was on the hall table from Beatrix Lehmann, saying, I've been hearing about what you were doing in, in German prison camps. I'd be very interested. If you ever come to London and have a bit of spare time, I'd love to have a talk with you, Beatrix Lehman. Well, of course, I went straight to London to see her. Well, I was stage struck. And uh, she said, I'm just, I've been asked to start a company in the Midlands, the Midland Theatre Company, supported by the Arts Council totally. And it'll be four weekly rep. We, we tour all the towns there. And um, to start in Coventry, I mean, the country, the, the, the city, more damaged than any other, excepting London in the whole war by bombardment, in that sort of rubble, start there and make a phoenix happen. And that, that had a romantic appeal. Anyway, I was still in the army. I had to finish my, until I was demobilized. And when I was demobilized, I went there and joined her. And um, after three months, she said, it's all yours. I'd had no training. Most of my energy went into covering up how little I knew. <laughs> but it was, you know, but it was, it was exciting to, that was the start. I have one other, where were you liberated? We were being taken east, uh, Hala, near Hala, going east to escape the advance of the, of the Americans. And um, we were told to, that, that, that the, 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 the guard company was still with us. But there came a day when they knew their time was up and they were going to deprive us of their protection. And they told us that we must not be surprised if they're set upon by the townspeople nearby. No, it was never any set, no, no one, that was all nonsense. And we just were then under British control for the first time in five years. And everything became rather pompous. We were extremely <laughs> disordered and that all we had to do. And whenever if, if any tanks appeared, we'd all had to go back to our bits of straw and lie down, keep quiet. 
when the tanks did appear. People waved excitedly from the windows. We all rushed out on the roads. <laughs> and that was the end of our war. Oh well, it wasn't quite, but you know, that was a very joyful moment. American tanks, of course. Great big huggings and things going on. Oh my God. Yeah. Your time in the camps, as you say, it's a time of putting on plays, but it's also a time of introspection. Do yes. you think that influenced how you turned as a director, the fact that you had years to think about what you were going to put on stage? Yes. I also used, I mean, it's funny, because my, my brother didn't have a good time. He was, I, I guess, my temperament adapted to a monastic existence uh, fairly easily. Uh, and I can remember waking up in the morning and thinking, oh, my God, I hope the war isn't over yet. There's so much I want to do first. <laughs> right. um, yes. And, and we, we, I mean, we, we had problems with people who were very good at playing the women in the plays we do. You, you know, used to develop real fan clubs. They'd be lying on their bunks during the day and doing their nails with their fans around them. And it was, you know, a real world of theater in, in its way. Uh, Lying on their bunks during their nails during the day. Well, being, being, being stars, you know. <laughs> um, but a lot of people made use of prison life and did, did pass exams and that. Because we were officers, I was an 18-year-old officer when I was taken prisoner with no right to be a, an officer, really, a second lieutenant uh, in the Gordon Highlanders. 